Yeah, uh, and just to remind you, there will be the opportunity for a bit of joint discussion after our second speaker. So if I can just introduce you now to uh, Mr. Lee Van Rensburg, who's actually one of my colleagues in Cambridge, who's an uh, orthopaedic surgeon with a particular interest in the upper limb and trauma, and he has a considerable tr uh, background in trauma as well. So often when we see these people with rib fractures, they have multiple injuries, and part of the theme of this morning has been multiple injuries and working with special, other specialties. And so he's very kindly come over from his uh, uh, AO course, also in Edinburgh, to give us a talk about uh, surgery at the junction. Thank you. Um, so uh, welcome to the orthopaedic zone. I do feel a little uh, outnumbered here, so, uh, but I'll give it a go. Uh, you know, I'm sure I can uh, get there. As I say, I've been especially interested in upper limb trauma, and I work at Edinburgh's Cambridge University Hospital's NHS Trust. Most of the stuff I talk about is on easytrauma.co.uk. There's a little file structure on the right, which is the presentations. And if you want to, by all means, go download it if you need the references that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the clavicle, I'm going to talk about the scapula, and the sternoclavicular joint. And classically, the clavicle has been described in fractures middle thirds, the middle third, the medial third, and the lateral third. And that was because there was one point to remember about each third. In orthopedics, we keep it simple. The lateral third, one third will be slow to unite. The middle third is the most common, and the medial third is the most uncommon. And that's how we used to classify things, to keep it simple for us orthopedic surgeons. But in fact, here in Edinburgh, Robinson brought out the new classification. We broke it up into the fifths, the medial three-fifths, the lateral one-fifth, and the uh, uh, medial one-fifth. And that reason being is it's about the ligaments on the lateral side, which define how the lateral one goes. But for the presence continuation of this talk, I'm really going to be talking about the middle third and the diaphyseal ones, that middle three-fifths, all as one group. And they're common, about 2%, 5% of all fractures, 80% of clavicle fractures, and most often it's non-operative treatment. Nothing to think about. Um, sometimes you'll see patients coming back from Europe with a figure of eight bandage where it pulls the arm back and thought to bring the scapula out and the clavicle back out to length. It makes absolutely no difference. All told, the non-union rate, in terms of, I'm not sure what the non-union rate for ribs is, but for clavicles is about 4.5%, but that's all cases. Um, there's this new concept now of shortening. So if your clavicle shortens by more than 1.5 or 2 centimetres, Hill in 97 and McKee in 2006 wrote papers and showing what the deficit was. And I think not just looking at your ventilation times, your hospital length of stay, but having a look at the function of these patients and how quickly they're going to get back to life. In your, in your rib fracture patients, you might look at that as well, seeing how quickly they get back to life in this world of microwaves and emails, and I'll continue that theme in a moment. But it's about the shortening. Not that you've got a manky arm, it's not a useless arm, but when you bring your arm up above shoulder height, people notice it. They get some degree of fatigability. Now, the problem for us is our outcome scores are useless. We've got the constant score. That was my predecessor from Cambridge. Constant, the most cited uh, score in shoulder surgery. He's up there. You know, he's up there twice as many citations than anyone else, but it's useless for the clavicle. Most people use it for the clavicle, but it's useless because most of it works on range of movement and pain. And a lot of them don't have a lot of problems with range of movement. In fact, if you've got two centimeters shortening, you'll get your arm all the way up above shoulder height, but you'll struggle with the fatigability when you go up above shoulder height. Now, is it because the shoulder's got some ptosis and it's being brought forward? Or is it because it's shortened and you're getting some degree of thoracic outlet obstruction? I'm not sure. Anyway, the outcome scores at the moment aren't great. But here we've got a 36-year-old female with a fracture of the clavicle, and I realize I'm talking to a non-orthopedic audience, but you can see that there's some displacement, so there's a gap between the fracture fragments, and there's a number of fracture fragments there, so it's comminuted. So classically, in old textbooks, McRae comes from a, a, a Scotland, uh, updated textbook by ESSA, that's where I did my fellowship. But most of these would have a short little paragraph on clavicle fractures, which would end with non-operative treatment, broad arm sling, and off you go. But this lady, 10 months later, had pain at the fracture site, was tender at the fracture site, and had prostheses running down the arm. And if that's a radiograph, you look at that, I mean, you can see balls of callus there, can't you? A whole lot of callus, and you think that perhaps that's united. But she had neurological symptoms, and so we did an MRI scan, and what that showed is a big ball of callus pushing on the brachial plexus, and she was getting thoracic outlet obstruction. Perhaps why are those displaced ones, they kick out more callus, they get more thoracic outlet obstruction. It may not just be a full feature of the shortening. Now, you may have said to me, Lee, it's bones, you get a CT scan to see the non-union, but what we really wanted to see here was the brachial plexus. But could we have predicted this non-union? Could we have predicted that this one would, one would be slow to heal? And again, Robinson from Edinburgh stratified them and said that overall, the non-union rate is 4.5%. But if you look at those, those that are displaced in females, you'll go up to 33%. And if it's commuted, your non-union rate at six months will be 47%. And so it's about comparing apples to oranges. 
And uh, when you have a look at your clavicle fractures or your, 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 your rib fractures, you know, counting them up one to six, but also have a look at the morphology of those clavicle fractures, uh, I think uh, you'll find out that soon enough you'll also be looking at uh, various different uh, pieces of fruit. Robinson worked out this very clever prognostic index, which basically said that if you've got a diaphyseal fracture, there's a number of things that will predict how slow it is to heal, and it's a very long formula. Uh, but basically it works out, if you're a 35-year-old female, you'll have a prognostic index of 1.95, which means at six months, there's a 35% chance that your collarbone won't be healed. So this is what it all comes down to. It's weighing up the pros and cons. This is what's wrong. What can we do to make it better? The scales of justice. And so perhaps for 36-year-old females, we should be fixing them. As is always, you get an idea, you come up with your randomized study. Came out of, uh, 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 came out of Canada, the Canadian uh, Orthopedic Trauma Society. And they did a randomized study of 132 patients, non-operative versus plate fixation of diaphyseal fractures, that middle third, yeah, the most common one, 80% of them. And they showed that shoulder function scores were better at all time points. And the mean time to union was weeks. I've done the maths because orthopedic surgeons are not good at maths, and I've got to put the number on the screen. 6.6 .6 months waiting for your collarbone to heal. So, I don't know how many 36-year-old females there are out there, but there must be one or two. If you break your collarbone, it's displaced and it's uh, commuted, it'll take six months to heal. That's a long time waiting for your collarbone to heal in the world of Mark Graves and emails, where things go by. You look at your, your thing, someone sent me that email 30 seconds ago, where is it? There's something wrong in the world. And then you tell them it's going to take six months for your collarbone to heal, or it's going to take you two months for your ribs to heal before you can get back to life. Now, with collarbones, it's not absolutely that they've got a manky arm, They've got a good arm, they can still do life, but they will struggle with overhead activities. The sports people, the people who are a bit in, uh, in, impatient. And so the Canadian study then looked at, even if we fixed them, there were still problems. The non-union rate was two in the operative group, and there were some malunions in the non-operative group. And this is all about weighing up the scales of justice. So what can go wrong if you fix them? Those big, long incisions, perhaps, which you use for your rib fractures, for us, the plate sits just under the skin. The little supraclavicular nerves, they get neuromas, and you can get breakdown and real risk for us in, when I was training, which is why we never fixed them when I was training, was if you got wound broke down, it was a world of pain, okay? Complications mostly are prominent metal work, three infections would settle down, and mechanical failure. We've almost solved that mechanical failure now with pre-contoured injury-specific plates, much which was uh, described there, those uh, clavicle plates, plates that were made for that particular injury. They're now plates for clavicles, which are left and right, and there are studies now coming out that bringing out sex specific differences in clavicle plates. We're not quite sex specific yet, but maybe in our lifetime. So the problem is the, mechanic, is the prominence of the metal work. I've had the letter from the GP, would you like to see this gentleman? He was carrying a fridge down the stairs and now his plate is visible through the skin. And so one other way to fix it is perhaps to use an intramedullary technique like that, where you put uh, something intramedullary to avoid the metal work. Um, I must say, I'm still using most of the time plating them, but sometimes indications you can hide your metal work within the, the marrow cavity of the bone. So nowadays, when you're faced with a displaced clavicle fracture, it's no longer a five-minute conversation. It's about Mark Graves and emails, the scales of justice, looking at how long it's going to take for them to heal, and then checking their risk profile, whether they're willing to jump out of a plane for the pleasure or the experience of it, deciding whether they want the benefits of surgery, earlier return to function, better shoulder function scores, and risking the, all the problems of uh, any form of surgery. That article came out, and I, I do wonder if your article on the randomized study, or they will be coming out soon, there's one happening in Canada as well, I think, these randomized studies came out on a, a clinical uh, fixation of clavicle fractures, and it became open season. Every single clavicle that looked like that got a plate on it. It was just, it was beautiful. It was nirvana for us orthopedic surgeons in that limb. We hadn't been fixing clavicles till about 2000, 2005, and now suddenly it was open season. Robinson, again, voice of reason, comes from Edinburgh, and he wrote, brought out this article. And if you do want to read about clavicle fractures, that's the article you want to dig out, because it's a really balanced article on everything that you need to know about uh, clavicle fractures. And what he stressed was undisplaced fractures are best treated non-operatively, okay? So look at your rib fractures, because just because there's six or seven fractures, I think you also want to decide how displaced they are in their morphology, and I'm sure the studies in the future will sort of unfold all of these little mysteries. He also made out that reconstruction of non-unions have good outcomes. McKee in 2009, who's pretty aggressive, said, good, but not as good as if I fixed it now. But it really depends on the patient. And as yet, although there are rules to be able to decide which ones are going to be slow to heal, we don't know which one's exactly to fix early on and which technique to use. Robinson what queried this treatment effect. And so if you had a look at this, this is the Canadian study, there were better outcomes. The constant score, the higher you are, the better. Uh, he's a, not a very tall man, but the higher you are, the better. And the dash scores, the lower you are, the better. 
And you can see here that at all time points, those that were operated on did better than those that weren't. Robinson questioned whether the magnitude of that treatment effect was enough. And uh, the important thing there is that there was only roughly 10 points on the scale. This is the graph again from the study. This is at the DASH score, the disability score, how bad you are, how much you're not functioning in the world. And you'll see that those that were fixed got down to a pretty low disability score, and that's at six weeks. I would put to you that they were down at that level at two weeks. So if you've broken your collarbone, I'll get you back to desktop work, I'll get you back to clinics and seeing patients within two weeks, okay? Uh, they'll catch up at the long term, but that's 52 weeks. That's a long time to wait to get to where you want to go. So Robinson questioned if that gap was big enough, but the important point if you do fix them is they'll get back to reasonable function pretty good as long as they're willing to take the risks of surgery. I think I'll just scoot along to scapular fractures and uh, questions at the end. So scapular fractures, there's a number of places where you can break your scapula, and they're pretty rare as all shoulder fractures, but 5% of all shoulder fractures, and you can classify them basically where they're broken, and then various people have grouped them together in different ways. The scapular body fractures make up about 45% of the scapular fractures. Those are the high energy ones associated with chest injuries, but most of those get treated non-optively with a broad arm sling for comfort and assisted range of movements so that they don't get stiff. And most will unite and be left with good shoulder function. A few will have male unions and non-unions. Sometimes they get a prominence here in the armpit and they get a bit tender there. And I've had it one or two over the last seven years that have had a non-union. But generally they don't cause you mischief. The glenoid neck fractures, these are the potential mischief ones, and they may either exit lateral to the coracoid, remembering this is the center of the body line, or medial. And uh, the lateral ones are the ones which are very uncommon. And uh, those are the ones that are unstable. There's absolutely nothing attaching that little piece of bone and your arm to your chest wall, essentially, or not to your body. Um, and so they're inherently unstable and often require surgery. Those that exit medially basically create two fragments, a medial fragment and a lateral fragment. And then these fragments are then attached to the body via the various ligaments around the shoulder, the coracoclavicular ligaments, the chromioclavicular ligaments, and the coracochromio uh, uh, ligaments. Um, and so it really depends on how they've broken that we might treat them, and I'll show an example in a moment. They're really dis 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 defined on whether they're displaced or undisplaced. And if they're undisplaced, essentially they'll heal on their own. If they're displaced, you may consider surgery. And displaced is defined by one centimeter and more than 45 degrees of angulation. And it's important to, dis dis to define this degree of displacement, a uh, degree of comminution, because then it makes sure that you're not talking about apples when you're uh, actually looking at oranges. Most are treated non-operatively, and I'll talk a bit about the SSSC, the superior shoulder suspension complex in the moment, unless there's a significant injury to those ligaments around the shoulder. Operative treatment is for those that are displaced or they're rarely active. We've got this thing, the superior shoulder suspensory complex in the shoulder, where you've got a ring of soft tissues around the shoulder, the glenoid, the coracoclavicular ligaments, the chromoclavicular ligaments, and the chromium. And then you've got these two bony struts, the lateral aspect of the, the, the scapula and the clavicle. And if you break those, uh, that ring in any two places, that's when you've said to have a floating shoulder. Essentially, once again, you've disconnected your arm from your body. Uh, the classic is the fracture of the clavicle and a fracture of the glenoid neck that exits lateral to the, to the coracoid. Surgery really depends on how bad those ligaments were injured. I won't go too much into intraarticular fractures because I don't think that's uh, too interesting for you. Uh, that there's a whole lot of different kinds and generally if they're undisplaced you don't fix them and if they're displaced you are fixed them and you approach them most times from the back. So you're coming up here and you're splitting between infraspinatus and teres minor. There's something called the internervous plane. Infraspinatus supplied by the suprascapular nerve, teres minor by the auxiliary nerve. Except for the type 3s, and that's where you split your glenoid coming into the notch. And that's because everything pulls on the front on the coracoid here. Conjoint tendon is pulling on the front, and that's one that you might then consider operating from the front. Uh, in terms of the surgery, again, most times when you're approaching the scapula, that's a fairly big incision. It's a fairly bloody procedure. It's a fairly vascular area, which I'm sure you're aware when you're going up top there. And there's a number of incisions. This is just one where you can run like that. There's a few others where you come down and come down the lateral border. And it really depends on what kind of bone you're trying to get to. The beauty thing about the scapula, though, is that as soon as you get the posterior deltoid out the way, either by releasing it from the acromion or just by elevating their arm, you'll actually find that delta sneaks away and you can lift it up with a retractor, you can then get to the whole of infraspinatus. And you can lift infraspinatus off the whole of the back of the scapula on its pedicle, the suprascapular nerve and vessel, which is coming around the notch over there, and you get access to the whole back of the scapula. It's beautiful. It's all right in front of you. 
Um, you can extend it towards the joint if you need to, to be able to see into the joint, and then you can put the plates on the, the different parts of the scapula. So just an example to see sort of what our decision making would be. And so there's a 40 year old female and that's uh, her in injury. Um, and so uh, I won't ask the audience, but unfair, hey, cardiothoracic surgeons, and I've got all, no. Anyway, so she's got a glenoid neck fracture. I don't know if you can see it running through there. And this is the type B, the one that exits lateral to the coracoid. And so this is the one where it really depends on what's happening with those ligaments, whether this is stable or unstable, all right? She's also broken her clavicle and it's displaced. And remembering here, it's a classic uh, sort of uh, floating shoulder is when you've got a denoid neck fracture associated with a clavicle fracture and she's totally disconnected her arm from her, from her body, okay? Now, when we come to the clavicle fracture, the beauty of the volume rendered 3D CTs, you can see it exactly as it is. There's a displaced clavicle fracture. There's the, the glenoid neck fracture, the glenoid neck fracture coming into the base of the coracoid. In fact, she's got a little bit more. She's also broken her acromion. But for the clavicle, 40-year-old lady, there's a good chance with that degree of displacement that she's going to take a long time to heal. And so I can talk to her just on the basis of her clavicle fracture to fix her clavicle fracture, okay? But we also know for most of the floating shoulders, the thing that you do is to connect the, the arm to the, to the body is you can fix the clavicle. And that's what we went on and did. And so that's a, a, a fixed angle locking plate, uh, injury specific, left and right. And uh, uh, that's a sort of bolted her clavicle back out to length. And now what I'm really doing is looking at this glenoid neck fracture and the glenoid to see whether that needs surgery. And in fact, there's a very woolly gray area here of whether they need surgery or not. And it's really of whether you, you've got a winner, whether you think you can make this one look like a shoulder, whether you can't. You're looking at the amount of displacement. The further it's been driven in, the more you're gonna detension those muscles. The other thing I'm looking on this one is that's the acromion. I don't know if you can see it, but she's got a fracture of her acromion in, as well. And so every time she fires up deltoid, her acromion will be dipping down into supraspinatus, and so she's going to be a bit unhappy in terms of being able to elevate her arm up above shoulder height. Comes back to whether they'll jump out of a plane. Fortunately, she's a 40-year-old physiotherapist who wanted the best shoulder she could ever have and wanted to work up above shoulder height repeatedly, which gave me the opportunity to then fix her. And that's uh, the fixation. There's the 3D CT afterwards. You can just see the screws poking through, but I've re-established the medial board, sorry, the lateral border, and uh, lifted... Uh, infraspinatus right off the back of the scapula to get access to the back of the scapula. It's not absolutely anatomic there, but I've reconstituted the important parts, the chromium, that border, and pushed the glenoid back out to length. Uh, restored the length of all the resting muscles of uh, the, the short little muscles around the shoulder. Most of these, uh, lots of the implant companies have got their own one, this is just Acumed, but now most of the times in orthopedics we're not uh, bending plates anymore, we've got injury specific plates, left and right sided, and the screws here are only eight millimeters, and so an eight millimeter screw is not gonna have a lot of bite, and so if you're gonna use it, you're gonna have to use one that has a locking thread. Am I okay for time? Yeah. Talk a little bit about the sternoclavicular joint. It's a synovial joint, and it's the only articulation between the upper limb and the axial skeleton. I think this is important to know, is that uh, the primary centers of obfuscation obviously form when we're young, but the secondary center on the medial side here only really forms when we're 18, and it fuses in our 25th year. If there's anything that, uh, the mischief for the sternoclavicular joint, remembering that. If they're under 25, be a little bit nervous. It's a small area of bony congruence, so it's quite a lot of force goes through your sternoclavicular joint, but there's not a lot of bony stability. It's not like the hip. You've got a lot of force going through your hip, but it's going to have very big bony concave around it to keep it locked in. And so it's really important, these ligaments holding it together. And I won't bother, bore you with the details. I'm sure you all know more than I do the posterior structures behind the clavicle, but there was this article that came out in the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery 2013, The Dangers That Lurk. Now, you know, that's me, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Every time I go there, they're dangers. I mean, you going there all the time, they, they, they're normal to you. So it's uh, maybe not surprising that the brachiocephalic vein is often the, most, the closest, but not always the closest. Um, so sometimes uh, the arteries were a little bit closer, mean distance being six millimeters, but the shortest distance being one millimeters. Obviously, they're right there behind the medial aspect of the clavicle. The other thing they brought out in this paper was if you're ever coming to fix a sternoclavicular joint, when it's displaced, have a look to have, and have a reasonably good idea to know which vessel it's close to so you know which vessel is bleeding when it all turns, uh, turns bad. Okay, so you can get dislocations, can be traumatic or atraumatic. The atraumatic ones are normally Ehlers Danlos and then unfortunately normally pop out near the front. You can get fractures and you can get fractures of the medial third. 
they uh, make up less than 3% of all dislocations, normally high energy injury, and it's uh, normally for the anterior where the shoulder gets forced lateral compression, forced backwards and the scapular clavicle pops out forward, or the posterior compression, they're in the bottom of a ruck or a scrum, someone falls on them and pushes their shoulder forward and it pops out the back. So it may be anterior, posterior, partial or complete, acute recurrent or unreduced. Clinically acute, uh, you can often tell if they're anterior or posterior, but you can't always tell. And so some people have told me that's anterior, and I say, no, I'm not going to accept whether it's anterior or posterior until someone gives me some imaging. And you obviously have to ask about whether there's any evidence of injury to the mediastinal structures. When they're delayed, they may not have the soft tissue swelling, and you need the imaging. Um, watch out for the 25, people under 25 for that mes medial facile separation, whether it's actually a fracture subluxation. And so what you then feel is that the sternoclavicular joint feels normal because the sternoclavicular joint is still in joint, but they've gone through the physis, they've gone through the growth plate, and that little bit of clavicle has popped out the back. Plain radiographs, the AP and oblique and the serendipity view, I've tried to interpret these over the years. I don't even bother anymore. You're wasting your time. You can't make out what's left, which is right, which is up and which is down, but it is described, and I'm sure there is someone. And so nowadays, you know, most times I'd get a CT scan and a CT angiogram to show the relationship of the medial aspect of the clavicle uh, to the great vessels. In the world of volume rendering, there you see the volume rendering, you subtract it all, and you can see how that clavicle has been pushed out the back, and on this occasion is pushing onto the top of the aorta. So management of the undisplaced ones are non-operative. Most of them will get better on their own. If you've dislocated posteriorly, you really want to try and reduce that as soon as you can, within 48 hours, and often you'll try closed reduction first. If it's irreducible or unstable, then you need to stabilize it. This is the classically described way of reducing it. You put a sandbag between the shoulder blades, put a towel tip onto the clavicle and pull as hard as you can, having a cardiothoracic surgeon standing next to you. I've been a consultant for seven years. I've been in orthopedic training since uh, 2000, and I've only had two or three opportunities to uh, see it. I've had one opportunity to do it, and it wasn't as satisfying as they might suggest in those textbooks. Um, watch out for the in injury to the, medial to the mediastinal structures. Um, they always ask if they've got problems with swelling, structures are close by. This was a study by La Fosse in 2010, and they looked at 30 patients who had a posterior sternoclavicular joint injury, because these are the ones that are going to be mischief makers. These are the ones where we're going to talk together and we're going to be in the same place together. And they had 14 patients that were attempted reduction within 48 hours, and 16 patients over uh, 48 hours. Bottom line, what happened there? We've lost the um, presentation. Can you put it back on, please? Bottom line on that was if you have a posterior dislocation, LaFosse 2010, is that you think that you're going to pull them, they're all going to pull back and they're going to be stable and you don't need to open them. In fact, a large proportion of those patients had to be opened and stabilized even if you were within the 48 hours. If you were one of those rarer injuries where you had an epiphyseal separation, most of those... Um, no. I'm too quick for this thing. Most of those required surgery. Could be nice if they could. There's a few more case studies for yeah. discussion right at the end. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware we've lost it again. Can you hear me? Sorry. Okay, thank you. So, um, well, while we're waiting, Lee, can I um, uh, just make a, a, a comment? I mean, I'm not sure how many uh, posterior fracture dislocations of the head of the clavicle that my colleagues in the room have seen, but I think the ones that we see, uh, they're actually the lucky ones, because I think the bad ones, the unlucky ones, they die on the scene due to shearing of the great vessels. Um, and, uh, Thank you. Right. Um, I'll go a little slow. A little bit. We'll <laughs> okay. Slow. Um, so, of those patients, <coughs> what they basically, the, the final comment was that 25 required open reduction, okay, and uh, 18 of them required some form of stabilization, and all of those facile separations, so all of those, uh, the tweenies, the 25-year-olds to the 18-year-olds, they all required some form of open surgery. So when you come to stabilize it, there's a lot of different ways of stabilizing it. Um, this was just a material study where they used uh, strips of uh, subclavius to hold it back down onto the first rib. You can use the disc to try and uh, repair it. Uh, but the figure of eight uh, reconstruction is probably the strongest, and you can use autograft or allograft. Um, personally, if it was, I was going to do it, I'd use a hamstring uh, allograft. 
And so here's a 38-year-old who had a motocross uh, bike, and this was my first patient. I was being a consultant, I'd been a real, you know, had a real job for about uh, two or three months, and he came in, I didn't have much time to think. And so they put him on the list, and so I pulled, and I looked reduced on the x-rays, and I thought, is it in, is it out, is it in, is it out? In fact, I wasn't quite sure. And so uh, I've got another CT scan again at, at six weeks, and you can see that it's uh, still out. And now what do I do? Now I'm starting to bury my head in the sand. I'm starting to think, ooh, I don't want to be here. I wish I could be a registrar again and just go back to where we were before. And where's Mr. Constant when I need him? And so the risk of leaving things stuck out the back is a delayed erosion of those mediastinal structures. And so it's generally said that for posterior dislocations of the sternoclavicular joint, you can't really leave them unreduced. And so you need to do something about them. And it took, me, it took me quite a while, it took me about two or three months really before I pulled my head out of the sand on this one and realized, Lee, you've got to grow up, you've got to do something, you can't just leave it there. And so I did a figure of eight hamstring on him and everything went well. Um, this is a 22-year-old female and now she's four months down the line. She did this while she was on holiday. I um, can't remember if it was a banana boat or if it was something to do with water and she, she came off awkwardly and she sustained that injury. And you can see how the clavicle on this side is tucked behind the manubrium, tucked behind the manubrium and way behind the manoeuvre on that side, but it's four months now until she started to kick up a little bit of callus. She's formed her own little bony strut. And so the fear here is not really about erosion. She's had four months, six months, well, she may still erode some of the structures around there, but what happens when she falls over again and she's only got that small little piece of bone there stopping her whole clavicle from being driven in towards her mediastinum. So a long discussion was had with her, and I'm not sure how many in the room would just live with that, with that thought that uh, next time you fall over, you're gonna drive your clavicle into your mediastinum. No one's gonna do nothing? Anyone gonna be tempted to do nothing? Okay, so we went, uh, there's a, a CT angio if you wanted, it is close to the mediastinal structures. And so we went ahead and again, did that uh, sort of figure of eight, this is post reconstruction, you can see nicely how it's now on the uh, manubrium and if it's likely to go, it's gonna come off the front and it's that figure of eight weave. So he has an 18 year old and he's on a quad bike. You get these usual x-rays, you can't make uh, head nor tail out of it. But on the 3D CTs, you, know, you can see that the, there's been disruption to the sternoclavicular joint on the side. It's gone up and it's gone a little bit back. Does anyone see anything else interesting on this, on this CT? His physis is going with him. Can you see those little dots? Those are his second drossification centers just coming at the age of 18. And so generally patients who are Younger than 25, it's said to be a physial separation, okay? You go through the physis. But on this occasion, this is a true sternoclavicular joint dislocation in an 18-year-old. Now, it may be interesting, it may not, but uh, it's just a, this one has gone a little bit back and a little bit up. Is anybody gonna leave him at the age of 18 if he wants to continue with an active lifestyle? So we're gonna go in and do the same thing. And so he went in and he had a, a, a posterior, uh, 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 stable, he had a stabilization of the figure of head hamstring. He had quite a lot of pain afterwards, and so I did wonder if we'd done the right thing for him, because he was up and back, but not that back. He was more up than back, but uh, we, we did it for him. So he has a 16-year-old. 16-year-old, you're starting to think? Physial injury, okay? And he comes along at two weeks, and there's the CT scan. There's the medial aspect of the clavicle. Uh, there the vessels at the back, and uh, I'm not going to name them, because you know them better than I do. But uh, if you have a look at his volume rendered CT, you can see clearly how that end of the clavicle is pushing on the brachiocephalic vein as it's coming uh, at the back. But this is not a sternoclavicular dislocation because in fact when you examined this young man, he had an absolutely normal, and I mean normal, feeling sternoclavicular joint that I thought to myself, burying my head in the sand again as I always do, maybe it's reduced itself. Maybe we'll be all right. Maybe if we just turn that light, everything will be okay. But it wasn't. The other thing interesting to see, he was at three weeks. You mentioned that it's about clavicle fractures. You know, he's already kicking out soft callus. Callus forms because of strain. Strain is the change in, 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 in length of a structure. And if you get that strain just right, and what happens with your ribs, which is why maybe it's healing faster, not because it's a round bone, is because you've got this strain maker all the time of your lungs. You've got an auto axial, we used to do it with external fixators. We used to shake them up and down a little bit to, to generate the strain. And maybe your ribs are healing faster, because you, not because of the way they're shaped or the way they form, but because they've got this continual strain on them. But anyway, you can see here, he's already generating a little bit of callus. Uh, that's in there now. He's only 16. It's very close to that brachiocephalic vein. Anybody tempted to leave him? 
He's 16, hey? Now, if you go read the textbooks, you read Rockwood and Green. Uh, Rockwood and Green, he's, that's our tome, a tome of three volumes. It's really beautiful. And they talk about these uh, facile separations and that if you left them 10 or 15 years, they may remodel. And in fact, if you went to uh, Howard, sorry, sorry, ma'am. Sorry, if you went back to this case, at least it's only the surname, Lee. Um, went back to this case, you'll actually see that there's a number of CTs and over time, over about another two or three months, because it took a while for her to come and find us, that little spur got a little bit bigger and stronger and that piece of clavicle at the back became withered. That when I came out there, it was a bit like a polio limb. It was all withered and sort of fading away. So, ah, going the wrong way, slowly. So, yeah, we had a long discussion and we decided no, but as I say in Rockwood, they do talk about these fire seal separations in adolescence that will remodel and you, some people have advocated uh, leaving them. More common, if you read about them now, most people would suggest uh, uh, repairing them. And the reason you repair them is there are case reports out there of spontaneous death of people who've been walking around with this without knowing that it's there and it's, they've died and they've, without trauma and it's been due to erosion from that medial part. Unfortunately, this young man went to surgery and at the time of surgery, he developed a bleed from the brachycephalic vein. That's his x-ray. Uh, two days later, you can see the wires around his chest. The bleeding was stopped. He died three days later from a secondary bleed. He came along with that, with not a lot of pain, actually pretty comfortable. I don't know. I don't know. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that. And uh, that was quite a sober note to finish it on. Um, any questions from the floor? Does, uh, has anybody uh, get involved in these cases? Yeah, so Ian, please. I was made to sit in the orthopaedic program on um, last Wednesday afternoon, like two orthopaedic colleagues do what you did for two hours. It was quite boring for me, quite stressful for them, but uh, I think they appreciated I was uh, sitting there. Um, just a question about how you repair the uh, splinter pickle joint, because one of the things I'm Ian, interested in is our issues of costal chondral fracture dislocations of the anterior chest wall. And we've applied some of the techniques that you're using for your sternoclavicular joint um, uh, fixations, particularly using collagen-based tiger tapes, using yes. the figure of eight technique for the first of for ACJs as well, and we applied it to the costochondral junction without success. And we, and we wonder if it's because we're, 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 we're um, suturing bone to cartilage, because our costochondral junction, one end of it, of course, the yes. is, is very cartilaginous, particularly in the young patients we're seeing. Um, I mean, is any comments, any suggestions about how we can apply only thought on that, I would say, is if you're, using a college, if you're using an artificial material, it will fatigue fairly in time. So what you want is the biology to take over. So if you're looking for that to fuse, then you do need to take the cartilage off, stabilise it for a while, and de degenerate some proper fibrous tissue. So you, you, know, you might want to try and get bone to bone. The other option is to add some uh, the collagen tape. Is it actually made out of collagen, or is this a fibre wire tape? Polyethylene. Fibre wire tape. Yes. So fibre wire tapes are made out of polyethylene. They're pretty strong and they'll go for a long time, but they will fatigue failure in their own time. Also, some people get a, a, a sort of a granuloma reaction to the polyethylene tapes. And so you might be better off using actually collagen and so taking a hamstring or something like that. The nice thing about it is you can then weave a fibre wire suture into your a hamstring, or even pom not pom as long as probably be a little bit weedy, weedy, but into a hamstring and then put that on onto it. A lot of people in our world, at best, they presented art artificial ligament reconstruction of the sternoclavicular joint. I'm still of the old school believing in hamstring. Uh, w other way we extrapolate it is when we come to the AC joint. So the AC joint, the chromoclavicular joint, you've ruptured your coracoclavicular ligaments, and people have been trying artificial ligaments for a long period of time, but we're going full circle and coming back to hamstring probably being the best for longevity. We're bringing some biology there rather than just uh, you know, a year or two of uh, some sort of fixation. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, Ian, which uh, joint are you... So we're talking about uh, trying to do primary repairs to the costal chondral junction. So right. anterior chest yeah. where the costal margin uh, and the medial aspects of the rib have, uh, have essentially fractured dislocated. Right. Um, uh, it's a typical kind of injury you see in, in sports people. Um, and they often present with either an anterior dislocation or, so, or a posterior dislocation. If it's anterior, you sometimes try and do a close reduction of it, but it rarely ever works because it's quite an seems to be quite an unstable joint. Posterior dislocations often need to be openly reduced, and they normally present with it severe pain. Mm. You know, and, and, and in my experience, it's mainly with rugby players that type of 
I bring some biology in there as opposed to just putting fibre wire in the polyethylene. And there are, in the ankle literature, some reports of uh, foreign body reactions to the granulomas. I mean, it's a question for Mike as well, because we did talk about plating. And so far, I mean, Ed and I have had a conversation about this with, with various professional rugby players, about whether we should be putting metal work into these characters. And um, we ha I had a case of a fracture dislocation of a, of a sixth costal chondral junction. Uh, so the, 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 co the cartilage component of the costal just the top portion of the costal margin had fractured and the rib was dislocated posteriorly. And it seemed that it needed to be reduced because the guy was in severe pain. And traditionally, we're taught to cut the cartilage back and then just approximate the, the reduction to reduce pain because it's a pain, it's a pain issue. Uh, but we just, I discussed it with Ed and David actually about whether we could try and do a primary repair of that using metal work. But dissuaded because of the degree of impact these characters have to take and also concerns about plating across uh, a bone to cartilage and one of the questions for Mike is you know in relating you know putting plate and screws down on a cartilaginous you know uh, platform is that is that an issue? Uh, I've, I've done a few uh, of these uh, patients where we um, I'll just get it onto the floor I've done a few of these patients with uh, a, a pseudoatrosis or acute dislocation of the costochondral junction. And uh, my experience is that the, the system I use, the matrix system, the, the locking screws are strong enough to purchase and stay in the cartilage. They, they, they don't break out. Yeah, the universal plate, and just put in three screws, and it will stay there. The, the only problem is that you, you have to discuss with the patient that there is a bigger chance you have to remove them again. Because I have two patients now where uh, th there's a discrepancy between the stiffness of the plate and the cartilage. And I had one patient that had pseudoatrosis. I uh, re repaired that, and after two months, he came to me and said, it's over, I've got no pain, finished. And he came back about six months later and he said, I've got a new pain there. It's not the same pain, but it's a new pain I don't understand. So what I'm, uh, I made a CT scan and you could see that the, the, the cartilage had thickened about twice the, the normal size. And I, my theory is that he developed like a chondritis around the screws and the plate because there's a discrepancy between the elasticity of the rest of the cartilage and the plate you put in. So I removed the plate and he was symptom free. He had no pain anymore. So th that and the, the pseudoatrosis healed. And he's not how old? This was a guy about 60 years old. Okay. So, but, but what I always do is with all the pseudoatrosis, but also with the uh, a, a dislocation between the costochondral junction, is when you operate, you've got to take it down a little bit with a nibbler or roughen it up so the, the new scar tissue can grow there and make it stable. As uh, my colleague said, the, 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 metal, the hardware will ultimately fail if you just wait long enough, then the biology has to take over. Uh, but if you take it down a little bit, just nibble it off and make it rough again and, and the bone it starts bleeding again, it will grow to one another again. Yeah. So, uh, any more questions? Um, I mean, th that comment <coughs> reminds me of uh, a couple of cases or two or three cases that I've seen whereby a active person has perhaps had a, um, well, if I remember one particular case, a kickbox injury. They've probably had a fracture of their costochondral junction, then it's, it's, it's healed, so there's no instability, but they've got an overgrowth of bone and they find that, or, or cartilage, and they find that painful. Now, in that situation, uh, is it reasonable to cut it down, or is, it, it, is that going to resolve their pain? I wonder if anybody's got any experience of this. I mean, again, we've had a few cases where, I exactly what you said, patients who had chronic injuries, again, we see them late, um, with previous fracture sites across the costal chondral junction or even a sternal costal junction, sternal chondral junction, and they've just formed this very aggressive, almost like an osteophyte essentially, we've just, we've just removed it for them and, it, and it's sort of solved their, their pain issue generally. It's also a deformity problem sometimes, particularly if they're very slim. The question is, is that if the osteophyte and maybe the, the, 
thickening of the cartilage isn't a symptom of still some instability like a hypertrophic yeah. pseudoarthrosis because the, the pictures I showed you of the, the lady where I put in the plate with the, the MIPO instrument she actually she was a kickboxer and she got kicked in front and the, the, the rib dislocated from the sternum exactly at the point where you get the junction between manubrium and corpus and when I made a CT you see the, you saw an amount of small debris indicating that there was an injury there and a fracture and when I made an MRI in the T2 uh, you see edema there so I concluded that there has to be still some instability etc and I operated in uh, yeah I, it, it was confirmed you could move it up up and down a little bit more than you should expect it to be do. I'm reminded that you said that some some patients, when you fix their rib fractures, they still have pain, and of course, the original injury could have caused a permanent injury to the nerve. Yep. Um, so it's it's worth bearing that in mind. Uh, I, uh, I don't know if there's uh, anybody who's got much experience of the old left thoracoabdominal incision where the costal margin was divided. Uh, I, I used to be told, I, I, I've only got experience of that as a trainee, uh, I, I used to be told that they used to have problems with those healing and a variety of different methods were used to put that back together, steel wire, um, various different types of sutures. In the, the few cases that I saw, they all healed. So uh, I, I wonder, is there, is there some lesson in that? I mean, what, what were people using? What, what heals, what, what uh, helps that to heal? They don't always heal. Um, no, those were just the ones I yeah. happened to see personally. So I mean, the commonest indication in thoracic, which as you know is dwindling, would be if you're doing a thoracolap for an esophagectomy. So these patients are then gonna get poisoned if they haven't been already with some chemo. They're usually smokers, sixth or seventh decade. It's not a vascular area, so they have a permanent non-union quite commonly, but if they've got other issues in life that may not be their top five priorities. So d were you using steel wire? No, just uh, apposition, but uh, I used to avoid dividing it. If I was doing a sophagectomy, that was my way around it. Okay, right. Well, we finished early, so you've got time to get to your next session. Um, before we do go, um, Mike, the Society appreciate you coming to Scotland. You may be going to uh, buy yourself a nice single malt, so um, I'd like to give you a tum tumbler. Appreciation for your lecture. Thank you very much. And uh, hopefully named, I get the opportunity to do that for my colleague, uh, Mr. Van Rensburg. Thanks, Lee. Okay, the, the name. Thank you very much. Very nice.